I'm going to tell you a dark story in the history of archaeology. A story that took place not too long ago, and which still lurks in the shadows of academia. It's the late 1970s, and an archaeologist named Jacques saint mars has just made a remarkable discovery with his team at Bluefish Caves in northwestern Canada. He's found animal bones with cut marks that look like they were made by humans. He has these bones scientifically dated, and the oldest comes back as 24,000 years old. That's 11,000 years before people were believed to have stepped foot in the Americas. But his career took a dark turn when he presented his findings to the greater academic community, and this story has turned into a lesson that no archaeologist or archaeology enthusiast should forget. I'm Madam Archaeologist, your go-to informant on everything archaeology, and in this episode, I want to dive into something a bit different. I want to introduce you to the story of one of the bravest archaeologists, his turbulent experience with skeptics, and his later victory. And this all leads to a fundamental question. Is skepticism doing more harm than good in archaeology? Jacques saint mars story is, I believe, one of the most important ones in academia because, for one, what happened to him was unacceptable and we need to remember it in order to avoid repeating it, and two, it gives us a lesson on the dangers of skepticism. His story concerns a specific and important topic in archaeology, the peopling of the Americas. For the longest time, the Clovis first model was the only accepted explanation of how the Americas came to be populated by humans. I remember reading about it in high school, and it was taught to me as if it was a hard fact. I didn't even know that there was a debate on the peopling of the Americas until I started studying archaeology at university. And as time went on, I began to find out what an ugly situation it had actually become. Here's what the Clovis first hypothesis posits. Humans reached the Americas about 13,000 years ago, after the last glacial maximum, via the Bering Land Bridge, a landmass that once connected Siberia to North America. During the last glacial maximum, two large ice sheets covered Canada, the Cordilleran Ice Sheet and the Laurentide Ice Sheet. After the last glacial maximum, these sheets started to retreat, creating an ice-free corridor that gave humans access to the rest of the Americas. So, according to Clovis I, people reached North America about 13,000 years ago, became the continent's first settlers, and then proceeded to quickly populate the rest of the Americas migrating through that ice-free corridor. The name Clovis I comes from the Clovis culture, the name given to the material culture associated with what were believed to have been the first humans to populate the Americas. The culture itself was named after its diagnostic fluted projectile points found in Clovis, New Mexico, though many have also been found elsewhere in North America and some a bit further south as well. The Clovis I model is now dead. We have lots of evidence proving that humans were in the Americas before the creators of the Clovis culture, and I'll get to that evidence soon. But one of the earliest discoveries that contradicted this narrative was Jacques saint mars 24,000-year-old date at Bluefish Caves. He conducted excavations at the site from 1977 to 1987 and found archaeological material including stone tools and animal bones that bore what appeared to be marks left by stone tools. It looks like the site had been occupied sporadically by humans at different times, and when scientific dating showed that the oldest of these phases was about 24,000 years ago, Jacques was excited to share this discovery with his fellow peers. Any normal person would think, wow, that's an amazing finding. I wonder if there's more early evidence like this and what this means for the peopling of the Americas. Well, that's absolutely not what happened. And I guarantee, if you're unfamiliar with his story, that you can't even begin to imagine the treatment Jacques saint mars received from the academic community. He likened his experience once to the Spanish Inquisition. The Clovis first proponents took what was just a hypothesis and turned it into gospel. Saint Mouse, with his dates from Bluefish Caves that directly challenged their long-held narrative, was thus a heretic. The dates from Bluefish Caves suggested that people had reached Alaska and the Yukon Territory during the last glacial maximum, not afterwards, and the Clovis first proponents were not at all receptive to this possibility. They questioned whether the marks on the bones had really been made by humans, and they questioned the integrity of the site's stratigraphy. They came up with lots of alternative reasons for those marks without really grounding any of their explanations in the scientific analysis of the bones. They just didn't want to consider it a possibility that any of the cut marks could have been the result of anthropogenic activity. Meanwhile, Jacques saint mars couldn't see any other explanation for some of the evidence. 
but North American archaeologists refused to listen to him. They laughed at him, mocked him, called him things like cute. Essentially, if your evidence didn't agree with their picture, you'd be ridiculed at meetings and conferences. Jacques might as well have been talking to a wall. It's really baffling to me, because it's quite obvious that you don't treat people like that. And the voices of the critics had a rippling effect. Hardly anybody took Jacques seriously with all the doubt that had been cast on his work, and the criticism was so bad that he even lost the funding for his fieldwork. He was essentially driven out of debates within the larger academic community. When did things change? It took a long time, I need to emphasize that, but two important things happened. One, other archaeologists began finding more sites across the Americas with evidence of pre-Clovis human occupation, and two, the evidence from bluefish caves was re-evaluated by other archaeologists. This paper from 2015 and this one from 2017 reassessed the nature of the cut marks on the animal bones, and the latter paper even published new radiocarbon dates. A strict methodology was employed for the animal bone analysis, where six known features of human-modified bones were looked for. The conclusion that an animal bone had been modified by humans could only be reached if all six criteria for the sample had been met. At Bluefish Caves, five bones from a part of the site labeled Cave 2 and ten bones from Cave 1 met all six criteria, rendering the total number of animal bones certainly altered by humans 15. Another 20 fell into the probably humanly modified category. In the 2017 paper, new radiocarbon dates were taken from six of the bones that met all six criteria. The calibrated results showed that the oldest bone was deposited about 24,000 years ago, consistent with Jacques saint mals dates. Jacques had been right all along. A horse mandible and a caribou pelvis placed the oldest human occupation at Bluefish Caves between about 24 and 22,000 years ago. That's during the last glacial maximum, not after it. The researchers are confident that these bones bear human modifications. The 2017 paper states, I quote, the presence of multiple, straight, and parallel marks with internal microstriations observed on both specimens eliminates carnivores as potential agents. The relative breadth ratio, as well as the depth and opening angle that we measured, are in the range of marks produced by stone tools reported by experimental and archaeological studies. The breadth ratio also differs from marks produced by carnivore teeth. Sedimentary abrasion or trampling are also eliminated since the caribou coxal bone shows no other signs of abrasion and the long, parallel striae on the horse mandible are simply too regular. Furthermore, the anatomical location and orientation of the marks are consistent with filleting marks in the case of the caribou bone, while the presence of multiple cut marks on the medial side of the horse mandible indicates the removal of the tongue. Previous cementochronological analysis of one of the teeth from this mandible indicated that the animal was killed in spring or summer, thus suggesting a human presence in Cave 2 during the warm season." End quote. Other calibrated dates suggest human occupation between 22 and 15,000 years ago and at about 12,000 years ago. Together, all these dates suggest, I quote again, that Bluefish Caves is the oldest known archaeological site in North America and indicate that people used the caves on several occasions over a relatively long time, spanning from the cold period of the last glacial maximum to the Pleistocene-Holocene transition." End quote. In other words, this work validated everything Jacques saint mals had been fighting for. Let's move beyond Bluefish Caves, an important site that helped eventually shift academia away from the Clovis first paradigm was the campsite at Monte Verde. It's located in the completely opposite direction of Bluefish Caves in Chile. The site was discovered by the anthropological archaeologist Tom Dillahay in 1976, just before Jacques saint mars began excavating at Bluefish Caves. It had plenty of well-preserved artifacts, it had hearths, and it had human footprints and even some human hair. So there was no doubt humans had once been there. Tom Dillahay had the campsite radiocarbon dated, and it came back about 14,500 years old. Since people, according to the Clovis first model, were supposed to have arrived in Alaska 13,000 years ago, the date from the Monteverde campsite not only suggested that there was a human presence in the Americas at least 1,500 years earlier, but also that this presence was in the completely opposite direction, in South America. When news first spread about Monteverde, it was of course met with backlash, and it took two decades to accept that the site was, truly, 
over 14,000 years old. Tom Dillahay published two large volumes with data from 60 specialists who'd analyzed the evidence from the Monteverde campsite, and in 1997, he invited archaeologists who weren't so sure about the accuracy of the findings of Monteverde to check the site out. Everything checked out. The campsite at Monteverde finally was accepted to be 14,500 years old. But it wasn't easy for Tom either. His university received an anonymous letter from Clovis' first proponents asking for him to be fired. And even worse, another person sent a letter to the Chilean press falsely accusing him of being a CIA plant. I mean, this is beyond an intense academic debate, you're playing with someone's life at this point. And then the Clovis' first proponents showed just how disrespectful they were when they refused to shake Tom's hand at meetings and they even refused to give his graduate students any jobs. Their behavior was extremely dirty and unprofessional. But Tom persevered and proved to everybody he was right. I have a tremendous amount of respect for both Tom Delahaye and Jacques Cinq Mars. Now, this acceptance of Monteverde this early date helped begin a paradigm shift. Clovis I was finally beginning to collapse, but by then, bluefish caves had been mostly forgotten about. It wasn't until the 2010s, and specifically the publication of the 2017 paper, that some archaeologists finally began taking bluefish caves more seriously. But bluefish caves and Monteverde aren't the only sites in the Americas that contradict Clovis I. There are a handful of others. Huaca Prieto in Peru, also investigated by Tom Dillahay, is mainly known for its function as a ritual and burial mound originally constructed around 7,800 years ago, but Tom found that the earliest phase of occupation had been approximately 15,000 years ago. At the Manus site in the northwestern United States, the skeletal remains of a mastodon with a bone projectile point embedded within it were radiocarbon dated to roughly 13,900 years ago, and nearby, at the site of Paisley Caves in Oregon, human feces, a peculiar line of evidence, were radiocarbon dated to about 14,200 years ago. Humans were at Meadowcroft Rock Shelter in Pennsylvania at least 14,000 years ago, and at the Deborah L. Friedkin site in Texas, researchers dated a layer containing stone tools using another technique called OSL dating to roughly 13,500 to 15,500 years ago. At the Page Ladson site in Florida, Archaeologists found stone tools and a mastodon tusk bearing human-made cut marks and dated them to about 14,550 years ago. Now, this doesn't mean that the Clovis people didn't exist. They certainly existed, and they had a pretty cool toolkit. It's just that the idea that the people associated with the Clovis culture were the first people to populate the Americas is simply no longer tenable. And research has started to progress in a better direction. Since we now know that humans were south of the Cordilleran and Laurentide ice sheets before the ice-free corridor opened up, it looks like the initial migrations from eastern Beringia into the Americas likely took place along the Pacific coast. That's how Tom Dillahay believes humans reached Monteverde at such an early date. And what's becoming clear from recent research is that the peopling of the Americas was much more complex than originally thought. There's still lots more research that needs to be done. All of this takes me to the next point I want to address. Is skepticism doing more harm than good in archaeology? Let's consider these. It took two decades for Tom Dillahay's date at the Monteverde the campsite to be accepted, and four decades for Jacques saint Mals's findings at Bluefish Caves to be confirmed. It is very difficult here to see skepticism as being anything but a hindrance to progress. How much sooner could we have confirmed the accuracy of these dates had the Clovis first proponents approached discussions with a more open mind? How much more knowledge could we have had today had the discoveries at Bluefish Caves and Monteverde been taken more seriously by the wider academic community as the discoveries were being made? So, to answer my question, does skepticism do more harm than good in archaeology? Yes. Yes, it absolutely can. And I'm not the only one who thinks this. Journalist Heather Pringle published an article on Saint Mouse's story in Hakai magazine, and she won a journalism award for it. The article was then featured in the renowned Smithsonian magazine, where they stated that a toxic atmosphere can, in their own words, poison scientific progress. Tom Dillahay even stated that the scientific atmosphere was, word for word, clearly toxic and clearly impeded science. Here is what Heather Pringle herself experienced when she followed Psych Mouse to conferences. I quote, As I began regularly attending archaeological conferences in the years following that trip to Bluefish Caves, 
I saw what Slank Mills was up against. Sitting in halls with Canadian and American researchers, I witnessed what happened when archaeologists presented data that contradicted the Clovis first model. Often a polite bemusement spread through the room, as if the audience was dealing with some crackpot uncle, or the atmosphere grew testy and tense as someone began grilling the presenter, but once or twice, the mask of professional respect slipped completely. I heard laughter and snickering in the room. Tom Dillahay remembers such conferences well. Some Clovis first people had a suffocating air of defiance and superiority at times, he says." End quote. I really don't understand why academics tried to hold on to Clovis first for so long. It's not like a new discovery would have ended their careers or made them less reputable scholars. They could have just said, yeah, I believed in Clovis first with the evidence we had at that time because it strongly supported it, but now we've got this new evidence, so we'll have to take a new look at the situation. But Sigmel's story isn't entirely negative, because it's also a story of perseverance. He kept believing in his discovery, he refused to give in to mainstream belief, and I admire him greatly for that. And don't think for a second that this is a thing of the past, that archaeologists have learned their lesson and moved on. The arrogant attitude of the Clovis first archaeologists and others alike, unfortunately, still lurks in the shadows of academia. Back in 2004, archaeologist Glenn Schwartz discovered four clay cylinders in a tomb in Syria that boasted inscriptions in what appeared to be an unknown alphabetic script. The tomb was radiocarbon dated to roughly 2400 BC, making it the oldest known alphabetic script in the world, 500 years older than the proto sinaitic script, long thought to represent the oldest alphabet. But it took Schwartz many years to come forward with this, quite literally, history-changing finding. He published a paper in 2021, but was very cautious of his interpretation of his findings. It wasn't until a few years ago, in November of last year, a decade after the original discovery, that he finally presented his findings in detail at a conference after talking to various specialists and making sure the inscriptions were duly analyzed. Many specialists agree that this is an alphabetic script, but some are still skeptical and want more evidence. It's really sad when you think about it, because imagine just how much knowledge we could be gaining at such a faster speed if it weren't for some skeptics. Now, I'm not saying we should just accept every theory that's put forward. We still need to give our evidence and interpretations a critical look. Otherwise, what's the point of being an archaeologist? But we do need to make a conscious effort to shift our mindset to one that embraces open discussions, not stick to a mindset where new evidence is immediately rejected whenever it changes what we know, or think we know, about the past. Jacques saint mals evidence was dismissed and mocked only later to be accepted as fact. I can't begin to imagine what else that's mocked by archaeologists may actually be true. A question all of us archaeologists need to ask is, how can we find a balance between maintaining a healthy level of skepticism and embracing open-mindedness? Because that's what's needed. It may be a challenging question, but it's one that needs to be asked and thoroughly thought through. Because on the one hand, we need to take a critical look at our findings and interpretations, but on the other hand, we really need to stop hindering the advancement of our knowledge of the past. That's it for this episode. I wanted to share Jacques saint mals story because it's not very well known but has left such an impact on the field and I truly believe that it's important to learn history. If you want to avoid repeating the past, you need to study it. Don't forget to give this video a like and subscribe for more cool content by your go-to informant on everything archaeology, Madam Archaeologist.